Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Johanna Schmitz Pfeiffer will defend her academic thesis, The Power of Personality, the Role of the Big Five for Adolescents, Career Choices and Expectations. May I invite you to present the summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Yes. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Dear Pro-Rector, dear members of the Corona, dear supervisors, dear family, friends, and colleagues, I am full of joy and excitement to stand before you today and present the research results of my dissertation. I am deeply concerned with the topic of my dissertation, the role, the, the power of personality and the role of the big five for adolescents' career choices and expectations. Within the next 15 minutes, I wish to convince you all of the power of personality. I wish to persuade you all that integrating personality research into practical guidance for adolescents can make a true difference to the lives of young people. And I wish to infect you all with my enthusiasm for the topic of self-discovery and self-realization through scientific cognition. Before I start diving into the research, I want to give you a quick overview of the dissertation. It entails six chapters. Chapter one introduces the concept of personality and the idea of personality research. It introduces the goal of this dissertation, which is to promote equal opportunities and empower adolescents, teachers, and counselors to recognize personal differences and make use of this knowledge to improve the career decision-making processes of adolescents. Chapters two and three focus on creating and initially validating a novel personality instrument, which combines the requirements for a better understandable and contextualized inventory specifically designed for adolescents. In chapter two, the item development and the initial validation process of this new instrument, the contextualized personality inventory for adolescents or short CPIA is described. In chapter three, a longitudinal experimental design to demonstrate the incremental predictive validity of the CPIA is presented. In chapters four and five, we examine the interplay between personality, graduation expectations, and vocational decisiveness in Dutch high school students. Chapter four focuses on exploring general relationships and differences between school tracks, while chapter five compares a COVID to a non-COVID sample in that matter. Chapter six, the general discussion, summarizes the findings on this research and discusses the, the scientific and the social implications of this work. So let's dive into the research approaches and results. Chapter two centers on the development of the CPIA. We phrased and validated an initial set of 103 contextualized items. The finalization of the CPIA was unfortunately beyond the scope of this work. However, we effectively laid the groundwork for further scale development. In a study involving 530 German high school students, we were able to confirm the five-factor structure and establish convergent and discriminant validity. To achieve these results, we followed a well-accepted scale validation process. Our first step involved creation of new items. We decided to build the new inventory on the well-established taxonomy of the Big Five. The Big Five framework identifies five major personality domains, neuroticism, extroversion, openness to, agree to experience, <laughs> agreeableness, and conscientiousness. We collaborated with a group of laymen to compare 240 items from a popular NEO instrument with three other widely recognized inventories, seeking overlaps in phrasing and content between those inventories. This helped to identify reoccurring and thus relevant themes. 
Next, we formulated new items, addressing the identified overlaps, and also covering every of the 30 facets of the new instruments, with a minimum of three items per facet. In this process, we adapted the item language to the school context, using familiar and also straightforward wording suited for our target audience. Contextualization and the use of simple language was crucial because our aim was to create an instrument with, en with, with enhanced validity compared to existing instruments for adolescents. Given that the vocabulary of individuals may differ, differ from that of adults, easy, easy language was needed. Moreover, personality is known to be context dependent and stable across similar situations. Linking items to a specific environment, such as the school context in our case, enhances the validity of the instrument. We applied these principles when phrasing our items. We then conducted two rounds of surveys. The pretest involved 10 adolescents rating the items for understandability and relevance to their daily school life. After making Necessary adjustment, adjustments, the items were presented to a larger group of 530 students who rated the newly development, developed items alongside items from the German version of the EPIB 120. We then used Exploratory Structural Equation Modeling, or short ESAM, to analyze the data, resulting in a five-factor solution after several refinement rounds. After review and reallocation, we retained 103 items for improved model fit. We also confirmed this fit improvement through confirmatory factor analysis and assessed alpha values for, in, for internal consistency within the five domains. Furthermore, we explored the CPIA's facet structure using exploratory analysis. Convergent and discriminant validity were verified by correlating the CPIA with the EPIB 120. While we confirmed the five-factor structure, the aspired 30-facet structure could not be supported. Future work will involve generating and validating additional CPIA items to establish a balanced facet structure and assess its incremental validity compared to non-contextualized inventories. How this may be approached is described in chapter three. Just take a quick sip. <laughs> the study design proposed in chapter three aims to assess incremental predictive validity of the CPIA and explore the benefits of integrating personality information into career guidance. The study may be seen as a continuation of our study conducted in Chapter 2, as it is extended into a longitudinal study design. The future study will involve adolescents in their final year of school, with two surveys conducted. Survey 1 will be administered in the first half of the school year. It will assess personality traits using the CPIA as well as the EPIB 120. After taking part in Survey 1, participants will receive information material for their vocational orientation process, based on random assignment to one of three groups. Group 1 receives only descriptive information on jobs. Group 2 receives their individual personality profile. And Group 3 receives both. A year later, Survey 2 will be conducted with the same participants. It will focus on assessing the vocational status, life satisfaction, health, job or study performance, and satisfaction with the vocational choice of the participant. Further, it will examine the helpfulness of the information material received after completing Survey 1. Regression analysis will examine the relationship between the personality traits and the outcomes. By comparing the results from using the CPIA items with the results from using the EPIP items, incremental predictive validity will be tested. 
Additionally, the impact of the different information materials received after the survey one will be analyzed. Potential challenges of this experimental design include timing of survey administration, participation retention, and incentivizing the follow-up survey. Chapter four examines how personality traits of Dutch high school students influence the expectations of successfully graduating the current and a higher educational degree, as well as the level of their vocational decisiveness. Using a large data set, we find openness to experience and conscientiousness strongly predict these outcomes. The impact of these two personality traits is often even greater than cognitive ability. Thus, our results indicate that fostering openness and conscientiousness can positively affect students' beliefs about graduation and vocational paths. We thus advise teachers to actively support students in becoming more open and conscientious. For instance, by giving students more created and self-determined tasks. While this advice can be given in general, we still find differences between school tracks. For example, conscientiousness is a significant predictor for higher graduation expectations, however, only for highest track students. This research underscores the importance of non-cognitive abilities in shaping educational and career aspirations. By understanding these relationships, educators can better support students in making informed decisions about their educational and their vocational futures. In chapter five, we explore the same data and still look at the relationship between personality, graduation expectations, and vocational decisiveness of Dutch high school students. However, we focus on comparing two cohorts, one prior to COVID and one during COVID-19. We probably all now know from our personal experiences that the pandemic has brought sudden and significant changes leading to uncertainty and challenges. Thus, we were interested in the differences of those two cohorts. The results reveal that students of the COVID cohort showed lower levels of neuroticism, extroversion and openness, but higher levels of agreeableness and conscientiousness. The study also found that the relevance of certain personality traits for predicting graduation expectations and vocational decisiveness differ between the 2018 and the 2020 cohort. While during the pandemic, openness and conscientiousness were not even so important anymore, neuroticism emerged as a significant predictor for current graduation expectations, indicating that students with higher neuroticism levels had lower confidence in their graduation prospects. Additionally, cognitive ability became a more important predictor for expectations of completing higher education. These findings suggest that during the pandemic, educators should focus on supporting students' emotional well being, particularly those students with higher levels of neuroticism. Furthermore, Students in higher educational tracks should focus on developing cognitive abilities to enhance their confidence in successfully completing higher education. This study underscores the importance of adapting the curriculum and support strategies to the unique challenges posed by uncertain circumstances. To put it in a nutshell, this thesis emphasizes the need for a special, specialized personality inventory for adolescents and demonstrates the predictive power of personality traits in graduation expectations and vocational decision-making. It further investigates the relationships in both a non-COVID and a COVID sample. This research supports my great belief 
that personality assessment should play a role in vocational guidance along cognitive ability and interest assessment. It focuses on the predictive value of personality for career choices during adolescence, considering the significant biological and psychological changes that occur during this developmental stage. I do not truly believe, but also show with this research, that career guidance programs, which are often limited by socioeconomic status, could benefit from including personality assessment. The intention of this work is to enhance guidance for students and to contribute to economic research on personality outcomes. With this dissertation and in my future career, I deeply wish to empower adolescents by providing them with valuable self-knowledge to enhance not only their career decision-making processes, but any life-changing decision process. Thank you very much for listening. I will now give the word back to the prorector. Thank you for your presentation. The opposition corona exists out of five persons, two of which will be present online. But the opposition will be opened by Professor Dr. Carla Halemans, who was the chair of the assessment committee and who is a professor of human capital, educational technology and inequality at the Research Center for Education and the Labor Market here at this university. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear candidate, dear Johanna, uh, let me start with congratulating you with this fine dissertation. I very much enjoyed reading it uh, and reading about the power of personality and how the big five of personality traits may explain differences in uh, adolescents' career choices and expectations. And I also want to emphasize how much I appreciate that you combine both psychological and economic <laughs> insights and methods in this interdisciplinary te uh, thesis because we don't see that often enough. Um, I believe the topic of personality, uh, and especially that of, of personality of adolescents, is, is very relevant, very important, as it's crucial into explaining behavior. And I think for too long, economists have made the assumption that all behavior is rational. I think we do know better by now. Um, and the role of personality is crucial in this. However, of course, I also have questions and not just compliments. <laughs> So in order to take personality into account in the models that, you, that are used to predict and explain certain choices and behavior, it's crucial that we um, have good insights in what the role of personality is and that we measure that in an accurate way, uh, in such a way that we take into account the complexity of the world in which these individuals function. So my first question is actually about the models that you apply in uh, chapters four and five. Mm -hmm. um, where you use quite, well, let's put it simplified regression models. Um, and I was wondering if you could explain why you chose these models. Uh, you do not take into account the fact that students are nested in classes, that classes are nested in schools, and that especially in the Dutch uh, education system, school choice is, um, it's not random. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is freedom of cho school choice and you really see selection there. So it's very likely that students with similar personality traits choose for the same schools. And that may influence your results. So the first question is whether you can explain uh, or elaborate a bit on why you chose for these models and not, mm -hmm. for example, uh, multi-level models or models with clustered standard errors or something like that. And can you reflect a little bit on um, how you think that would have uh, affected your results if you would have taken into account the structure? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words and your question. So you're asking about chapters four and five in which we explored the relationship between personality and um, um, graduation expectations and vocational decisiveness in Dutch high school students. Um, so we took a very large data set, um, which we looked at, of course, and first just had a look at what is there. So we had a lot of different variables. We had a lot of different things we could have looked at. And we did, of course. We took a lot of time just exploring the data and seeing what could have been done. And it was a long process to decide for this model and also for the variables we used then. Um, we wanted, of course, to 
make it relevant for the whole dissertation. So that was why we chose those three outcome variables on graduation expectations and vocational decisiveness. And we also looked at different models. So we looked at the correlations, we looked at um, just the regression models, of course, um, and we wanted to have it pretty straightforward because we pretty soon realized that there's more to it with the time in which we conducted this research. So we pretty soon knew that we wanted to compare cohorts also during COVID. And looking at these regressions, there were so many regressions included already because we have five domains of personality and three out outcome variables. So there were a lot of results which we found only from doing the correlations and the regressions. We then also talked about, of course, multi-level uh, models, etc. but it would have gotten very complicated. It was actually pretty <laughs> really complicated already having that many results. And we wanted to find something where we can also give a straightforward advice um, later on and compare it with uh, not only school tracks, but then also the different years um, with COVID and non-COVID. So it might seem very straightforward and it might seem uh, an easy approach, uh, but I think it really fits the, the results we wanted to get. And you were also talking about um, the socialization and the selection effects, which would have been represented then maybe in this research, research using a um, 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 multi-level approach. Um, we did write about it, um, but more in a descriptive way when talking about the mean level differences uh, in personality, right? So that was how we tried to explain how mean level differences ex um, came up. For example, that students who go to the highest school track usually have a higher level of conscientiousness, uh, the highest level of openness, etc. And of course, you can say that a student who is very conscientious already, may also want to go to a school where he or she can later on go to university, of course. But you can also say that a student who goes to a school with a higher track develops those traits. So that was, if I understood you correctly, was what you were referring to. So of course, taking that into account could definitely be a great ap approach when uh, exploring this data fur further and um, yeah. I hope this satisfies your question. <laughs> it answers it partly, if okay. I may, um, because maybe it's a good idea to go to my second question, which is also related to the models. So, um, because you referred to it already, the comparison between the COVID and the non-COVID cohort in chapter five. Uh, and here again, I have a question about, uh, about the model. Um, because you compare the two per periods by estimating separate regression models, yes. and then you compare coefficients. At the same time, um, there are more differences between these two cohorts than only COVID. Yeah. And you do not control for that now because you don't have them in one model. So I was struggling a bit to understand, to be honest, why you mm -hmm. decided to run separate regression models instead of including interaction terms. Mm -hmm. And here, if you would have used a multi-level model, mm -hmm. I guess I would be more easily convinced to say, well, that's not a complication to add, but since it's relatively simple regression models, yeah adding a interaction term wouldn't make it too much more complicated in my view. So I was really wondering why you decided to run two separate models instead mm -hmm. of having interaction terms in one model, which also would allow you to say something about significance of the difference between the cohorts. Yes, yes. Well, thank you very much um, for that question. So um, yes, you're right. We, we ran two separate regressions. We did that partly because, uh, and we, we did control for terms like age, we did control for cognitive ability. But in things, each model course, separately, yes, not yes. jointly. Because yes. that was what we also did in chapter four, and um, it's, it's kind of interrelated. So we wanted to keep it similar, but of course, you're right, um, maybe we, we should have done that as well to compare the results as well and to, to say more about the significance levels um, of the differences. That's true, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. The opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Brent Roberts, who was also a member of the assessment committee and who is a professor of psychology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. The floor goes to Professor Roberts. Hi, Joanna. Um, 
uh, I feel uh, somewhat self-conscious um, in this context, especially given the topic, um, because of course um, I found the topic and the effort to be um, quite nice um, as, as your psychologist. Um, I'm uh, oddly motivated to ask um, the questions from an economics perspective, um, because they're often the questions that I get from economists when it comes to some of the efforts. Um, two of them in particular. Um, so um, you've proposed to uh, create and um, validate a new self-report inventory um, for personality. Um, and I can't criticize you on that front, having uh, had the same impulse and having done the same thing. Um, one of the questions or perspectives that is often expressed um, in economics to me and to others in the psychology field is the skepticism towards, um, let's call it the self-report enterprise. It is, of course, the case in economics that preferences are often assumed and not measured, for example. So it is an odd thing to actually measure these things directly. And it is often the case that um, economists, Jim Heckman and others, have proposed um, going about assessing these constructs in more objective um, ways. And I was curious, um, first, why you did not go in that direction. Um, so uh, there are efforts um, by a number of economically oriented organizations and individuals to uh, develop objective measures and the like. And I'm curious to know um, why that wasn't the path you took. Dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words, words and the question. Um, I'm very sorry that I have to admit I didn't fully understand the question because of uh, the recording. So uh, I understood yeah. that you asked me why I did go in that direction and not use more jab, objective um, kind of uh, measurement, but I didn't understand the, um, the examples you had. So sorry. So it's, it's not so much examples as much as um, let's say a pursuit of an alternative set of methods. Um, so instead of asking people about their um, their non-cognitive skills, go about assessing them using experimental techniques or um, observer techniques or um, life data of sorts, um, things that could be assessed more objectively, um, for example, um, are, are seemingly often the priority for economics. I'm curious why you didn't go in that direction. Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, I'm just wondering, you were asking about the, the instrument, like we didn't, why would it not include that in the instrument or about chapters four and five for, or general? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, more, it's more of a big picture question, not in, in reference to a particular thing. It's more a question of you know, um, why did you go for uh, development of the self-report inventory as opposed to a different um, type of method when it came to um, assessing non-cognitive skills, because at least in my experience, the criticism that I often receive is that we rely too much on, on self-reports and we should move in a different direction. And that question is often motivated by economists, so I was surprised not to find um, that at least uh, mentioned in this case. So, um, thank you very much. Um, so, this research, I mean, it's really, really focused on personality and I know that and it's probably not a realistic representation of uh, what we need and what should be assessed uh, especially in practical uh, needs right for, for adolescents because that is what the ultimate goal is um, that is what I'm convinced about we need to do um, and we need science for that and of course we need to include uh, different and more objective uh, variables for that to look into um, and that's also why we say in this research that we need personality as one part of this. Uh, but this is really focused on the part of personality. It's, yeah, it, it has to do with uh, what I already did in my master's thesis, et cetera, and my personal um, enthusiasm, enthusiasm for the topic of personality, definitely. But it does not say that we do not need the other more objective uh, measures, right? Um, it's just one part of it all and uh, it's all very complicated because we're all very individual well beings and uh, so much needs to be taken in consideration but this is just yeah what we focused on sounds to me like you've been brainwashed to be a good psychologist which i can't of course object to um, either um a, a one follow-up question um at least in relationship to uh, a more economics perspective 
Um, another question um, that I often get and uh, I think is is quite valid uh, is um, how do you justify the effort to assess non-cognitive skills? And, and the typical response I see from an economics perspective is you know, return on investment of some sort. Um, and you know, in the absence of that, it's hard to, well, it's not hard. Psychologists will often justify the effort because we find a statistically significant relationship. Um, and I'm curious why you didn't um, pursue uh, the typical economics approach, which is to estimate how much of a return would be um, achieved by incorporating non-cognitive skill assessment um, into this type of, of area? Um, I honestly feel like going about this topic with an only an economic view on the return on investment um, yeah, actually plays down the, the value of, of this and why we need this. Because if we would go about uh, this with only the economic perspective and the return on investment, um, we should rather not do anything. Right. So um, I feel like um, this is the whole answer to that question, because, um, of course, I'm an economist um, and I think it's, it's really valuable also in economic terms to get this knowledge about people, because in the future you you will have less turnover, less investment costs because people find the right job and they don't have to change anymore. And we don't have hopefully, as many unemployed people, etc. But um, I think the, the appro approach, not looking at that in there, is, can also be justified from an economic perspective because it will have beneficial economic outcomes in the future. Thank you. The um, opposition will be continued by Dr. Alexander Dix, who was uh, the third member of the assessment uh, committee and uh, who is a research fellow in vocational training and lifelong learning at the VZB Berlin Social Science Center. The floor goes to Dr. Dix. Yes, dear Canada, uh, thank you for writing on such an important topic that I believe is going to actually become more important over time, which is the question how young people make also decisions over their own career. And this is one part of your study, which you show is partly related to personality. Um, well, I'm a sociologist, and when you say that context matters and there is a need to have a context-specific personality assessment, I would tend, I would tend to agree because our situation in life and our education, uh, our family, and they all constantly influence us. Um, also, they influence the, the way in we uh, perceive and act in the world. So, uh, however, in your chapter on the effect of COVID, you find then that those who were affected by the lockdowns uh, of the school closures and uh, the COVID pandemic were less li less likely to be extroverted or were on, on average less extroverted than those who were surveyed uh, two years prior. Uh, of course, you probably know that one of the main items in the extroversion scale is literally that I'm the life of the party. And of course, there were not many parties in the COVID lockdowns. So maybe you see an issue with this. My question is basically related to this. Um, whereas in the name of contextualizing the personality measurements, such qu questions might increase external validity. But in the case of such a thing as the nationwide COVID lockdowns, they might actually prove a hindrance. So my question to you is the following. Is there such a thing as too much context? And could or should there be a way for psychologists to try to measure personality uh, without it? Thank you. Dear esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question and your kind words. Um, I actually find your question very interesting and I have to admit, I didn't even think about that question before, <laughs> but um, it, yeah, it is a very relevant and valuable. I, you are asking about, um, in terms of the contextualization, depending on the circumstances, um, contextualization may be too much or may even push uh, the person who's being asked into a direction. Um, well, I guess so. However, it depends on which context do you need or do you use for which purpose. In our research, we are talking about career decision-making. 
Um, we chose the school context in our case um, for the CPIA because being at school, being a student is mostly related or yeah, to, to the future work context because it's basically the work of a student to go to school. So um, we tr use the context which is not only familiar to the students, which they're not only at every day um, and know very well, but also which is relevant for the topic which we are exploring all this research for, right? So the outcomes we are interested in does do concern the, the working context. And the working context, as I said before, for a student is school. So I guess in that sense or in, in, in those environments, career guidance, career counseling, um, it would be a good way to assess personality in the context of the school. However, um, if you want to assess personality of students in a different context or for another um, topic, so more general topic, of course, it could be the wrong way because you you probably all know it from yourself. We are we have a personality, yes, but we act differently around different environments and. Thus, the way I act around school may be close to work, but it may not be close to, um, I don't know, me at a party context or whatever. Um, yes, so of course, it must be dependent on the situation when to use which inventory, um, but I would suggest to use a contextualized inventory for the school environment when talking about career aspirations. Thank you. Would you have a second question? There's still a few minutes. Okay. Um, well, then in chapter four, you analyze a very important concept in the school to work transition literature, which is basically asking whether students already know what they want to become once they graduate uh, and once they finish school. So that you label this vocational decisiveness, which basically then means if somebody already has made a choice or at least has an idea of what to about their further career after school. Um, on the other hand, you find a positive correlation between the personality trait of openness and this vocational decisiveness. And I was wondering if this not is counterintuitive because the way I understand the concept of openness is that you actually are uh, tolerant to uncertainty and you you are able to explore different opportunities and yet you find that these people are more likely to have already decided on a career path. How do you explain this? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, yeah, you're referring to the relationship between openness and vocational decisiveness, which is a positive one. So we suggest that if a student is more open, he or she is more likely to know what he or she wants to do after school. Um, of course, you can think this would be counterintuitive because a person who is very open may have broad interests and um, yeah, may have many ideas about what to do. And there's just this variety of choice which may make it different, difficult to choose in the end. On the other hand, um, you can also see it in a way that an open student would probably also get in touch with those, those thoughts, probably even earlier than other students. So if I'm very, very open, I might be interested in exploring different opportunities, maybe from a younger age already. Maybe I will look into those things already. Maybe I will try out things. And that could be a reason for why students who are very open then also make up their mind earlier and also make a decision earlier. So that would be my answer. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Didier Fouarge, who is um, a professor of dynamics of skills allocation at the Research Center for Education and the Labor Market at this university. The floor is yours. Dear candidates, um, I'm, I'm thankful that I was given the opportunity to read your, your work, and I must say it's, it's well written and you display your mastery of uh, the field of uh, psychology and education, I mean, uh, testing uh, personality aspects and how they could affect people's uh, uh, decisions. Uh, and the choices that they that they make, and uh, it's a, it's a field of interest of my own as well. So I, I read it with with very great pleasure, 
And I have uh, a, a specific, I, I pay specific attention to one of the chapters, chapter three. Mm -hmm. And I think the beauty of that chapter is that the experiment that you described never took place. So any comment <laughs> that you would get on that chapter could potentially be fruitful for further work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I have four specific concerns with that chapter that mm -hmm. I would like to share with you. And I, depending on the time, I will have, we will deal with the four, but I will start with the two most important in my, in my view. So the first in the experiment that you, that you describe uh, and you presented to us also the, the contour of that experiment, you are going to have an information experiment that contains two types of information, information on jobs, 120 job descriptions, and an extensive battery of questions measuring the kids uh, or the students' uh, uh, um, um, uh, personality. And then some of them will get information on feedback on their personality, others on information on occupations, and then a group with two, the two types of information. So my first concern is that with that design, you will never be able to test the effect of whatever that you show to the students because you don't have a control group. So that's mm -hmm. the first concern. Then the second concern that I have is that uh, um, you provide us with a, a nice power analysis, and I think you overestimated the power of your design. And let me illustrate that. So uh, um, you, you, you show us a design in which you, I, remember, I don't remember the number, so like 316 uh, students could potentially be sufficient to identify the effects that you're after. Yeah. And, and it's, it's an overestimation for two reasons. One has been already illustrated by my colleague uh, Carla, who, uh, who, who said you know, the students that you treat will be clustered in, in school and you are not accounting in your power analysis of the clustering of students in school. But there is a second more important concern is that it's a clever longitudinal design, but it, it, it assumes two things. Is that it assumes that the 316 kids mm -hmm. that, you, that you get in your first study, that all of them will give you the consent and share their emails so that you can get to them in a second step. My personal experience with such design in a paper that we published in 2014 is that 50% um, of the students of whom I asked their willingness to sh to, to, for a second uh, intervention, uh, only 50% of the, that sample um, uh, agreed uh, to have a second contact point. And when I contact them uh, one year later, only 50% uh, um, uh, actually participate. So when I do the math, you will be left with 79 uh, students, which would be way too little to identify anything. So two concerns, the lack of a control group and uh, the overestimation of the power of your ex experiments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much, first of all, for the kind words and, of course, for your both que two questions. Um, I'm actually very happy you asked about Chapter 3 <laughs> and the experiment because, in fact, the experiment took place and uh, we didn't write about this. And uh, we talked about this before, uh, whether I should tell about it, but it's, it's the reality. And I can tell you, you're right about your concerns. And that is also the main reason why we did not include the results. Um, first of all, um, it was really sad because you can imagine it was a lot of work especially creating all this feedback. So we created a handbook with, one, with 120 um, jobs, job descriptions, requirements for personality. We took that all together. It was work of months. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I'm glad you're asking about that because uh, we did put a lot of work into this. We programmed it with the IT so that uh, the participants would get the feedback. Um, well, we, we do have those three groups. Um, so one that only gets the uh, information, uh, one that gets the personality feedback, and uh, one which gets both. So those would be the three groups we would compare. And um, we actually also did the comparison um, Taking, I'm, I'm actually really sorry, I don't even, I don't remember what the word of the analysis was we used for this, but we talked about, of course, not integrating a control group, but we found a way around it. Um, because we were, of course, also concerned about the number of participants taking part. We knew it was 530 more than the power analysis showed would be necessary, but still not enough. And that is actually the main downside of 
doing or continuing the experiments like we did before, because in the end, your math was not too, too far off. We had 80 and 84 uh, students responding. <laughs> and unfortunately, because the group assignment was random, uh, which is very important, of course, um, we only had four, I think, in group one. So, of course, the, the results we got, we, we could just not um, display because the groups were simply too small. And, of course, if I could do this experiment again, first of all, I would not do it during COVID because, believe me, doing a study with students at school during COVID just doesn't really work or it's, it's, it's really a pain. <laughs> um, so I would do it again. I would invest a lot of my time and work to really find those relations, or the relationships to the schools to um, yeah, really get people in there who are motivated about the study. I see it from my supervisor Trudy who does the Underweis Monitor and they do it every year and it's so much work just to keep the schools be there and continuing, and then also motivating the students to take part in the second study, to give their consent to take part again. And that is definitely something I would have done differently. And if we get the chance in the future, we have to with a much, much higher number of participants for sure. Do I have a Time for a, a, a short follow-up question. Then I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to drop one of my other concerns. Now yes, that I know the experiment actually took place, <laughs> uh, but you seem so. The, one of the concerns that I have with the conclusions that you draw is about the uh, the the, um, the the importance of informing students about personality for their career choices, yes. right? And uh, you seem to suggest in your with your experimental design. So I'm staying within the framework of Chapter Three, right? Uh, uh, you seem to, to suggest that career guidance uh, in Germany, in the Netherlands, is devoid of any information on, 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 on students' uh, personality and, and, and things that could drive their choices. But mm -hmm. my experience is that many of these uh, guidance platforms do include personality mm -hmm. uh, uh, tests, maybe not, mm -hmm. maybe not yours, but they do include aspects of personality. And they do try with their guidance to sort of tune students' interest in at least one or a couple of these 120 somewhat occupations that you use. So, yeah. so the other concern that I had is the information overload that you provide to the students. I mean, it's for me, that would be an impossible task to make a choice in the list of 120 occupations. Career guidance platforms are based, generally speaking, in using information on personality to inform the students on a set of occupations that would potentially fit their preference. And then on that, you could do interventions mm -hmm. with more information, better tuned information on their personality. So mm -hmm. the aspect of information overload uh, is something I would like to, to you to reflect on. And, and is it true that you are sort of maybe underestimating what career guidance platform actually do in mm -hmm. the actual day-to-day -day mm -hmm. cases. So I'd like a short reflection yes. on, on both. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so you're talking about um, guidance platforms online where you can take tests for, of course, personality, for vocational interests, for jobs that could suit you. Um, the problem with those um, tests that are made online is that most of those platforms are either cheap or they're for free. And that means that the tests which are used online for this personality, they're really not good because a, a really, really well validated test, like the NEO instruments, for example, they are being used in career guidance. But unfortunately, they're only used in individualized career guidance where the parents, for example, have to pay hundreds or thousands of euros because those tests are so so expensive and those are the ones that are really really good and really well validated and that was actually coming from my motivation for this work this was where I was coming from I personally did a test like that I was really really happy about it but I just found it unfair because I know that career platforms can help 
But what is really needed for students is actually every student should have a very, very well-educated counselor. Every student should have access, access to a very well-validated test, like the new instrument, or like the final version of the CPIA when it's, when it's done. Because those being used online, they're not the good tests. And of course, interest is related to personality. That's why, of course, the, the um, results you get online, they're not totally off but they're not also not totally right. And um, yeah, also to, to uh, add to this, I think it is more, because you were asking about the overload of information, um, of course, having individual counseling for every student, they, they need guidance for that. I know, I know that a handbook like we did with 120 jobs, that's not the solution, I know that. But we cannot find the solution within four years of work on this. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a challenge and um, I'm really motivated, motivated to take on that challenge because that's what I wanna use my career for. And um, yes. Yeah, I hope that satisfies your question. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Kalein Massar, who is an associate professor of applied social psychology at the Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience at this university. Thank you very much. Dear candidate, also for me, compliments about your dissertation. Uh, it really is uh, nicely written, and it combines the different uh, uh, disciplines of economics and uh, psychology. Um, and also, they provide a good starting point, I think, all the chapters for, a, for further research, as we've also discussed today, but also for a discussion. And today, I would like to ask uh, you to discuss with me uh, chapters four and five. Um, and what struck me, because also of my own research interests in, in people with a lower socioeconomic position, is um, how the results especially in chapter four, for the lowest vocational uh, or pre-vocational track mm -hmm. uh, pupils, how they differ from the other two groups for the higher. Um. Specifically, I noticed that for only these lowest track students, neuroticism mm -hmm. predicted um, both of these, these outcomes negatively. Um, and that struck me because one, yeah, for one, they, they sort of uh, differ a bit. Uh, f from the other groups, but also you state in your discussion of the same chapter that um, especially these lower track students, they have a more decisive um, style or they, they have a better uh, picture of what they want to do mm -hmm. in their future career. And mm -hmm. that is sort of contradictory with neuroticism in the sense that n n neuroticism also negatively uh, correlates with self-esteem and also self-efficacy. And of course, self-efficacy then is necessary to, I mean, you can think I want to be a uh, professor when I grow up, but also do you think you have the skills to actually obtain that profession? That's a whole different uh, uh, story. But what I want you to reflect on is how, um, how you explain your, your quite uh, firm statement that these lowest vocational school, uh, pre-vocational school students, they have a very good idea of what they want to do. But at the same time, the data seem to suggest a somewhat different pattern. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, dear esteemed opponent, opponent. Thank you very much for your question and the kind words. Um, you're asking about chapters four and five mm -hmm. and about the levels of neuroticism, especially for lowest track students. So um, we see quite high neuroticism levels for uh, lower track students, and we also see that the relationship between neuroticism and graduation expectations uh, and vocational decisiveness is really strong, negatively, um, yes. So um, this might actually, the, the question is why is this the case, of course? Um, so it could be that uh, tr um, students from the lowest track just feel more stressed out. I don't know, we, we didn't look into uh, other variables which could have been ex an explanation for that. So for example, yes, we could have also looked at the socioeconomic background mm -hmm. and maybe those students get less support from home, something like that, but it's only, uh, I can only hypothesize that. Um, but the main question you were asking was, why am I still so confident that um, students of the lower track still have better vocational choices 
or are more sure about the location mm -hmm. choice. So um, in this lower track, we combine two tracks, basically. Mm -hmm. It's the theoretical track and the practical track. And the practical track is a track where students are even before or when choosing this path, um, they know quite well in what, di what direction they want to go, right? So they are basically at a different point already when they choose for this track, but also within the track, their education is where, more nailed to vocation, right? Mm -hmm. To vocational practice, etc. cetera. Yeah. So during their daily life, during their daily school life, they have way more to do with what they want to do later, what, what is fun to them, what the interests them in vocational um, sense. So that is what highest and medium tracks students basically don't have at all because it's more about the academics, ac academics and theory. Mm -hmm. um, so that ca could bring about the difference. So one thing could be that the um, students of the lowest tracks, they just further along, mm -hmm. or the other reason could be that the others are just behind. Yeah. So it just departs those two groups if we take highest and medium track together. Yes. Okay, good. Um, and then also what I wanted to um, touch upon, and I think that my previous opponents also have touched upon it, you just touched upon it as well, is that of course individuals do not live in a vacuum. They, they are surrounded by other people, but also by, by institutions. So they, they especially these pupils, they, they're part of a school, mm -hmm. um, but they're also part of a community and they're part of a culture. And so these different levels of influence, of course, uh, affect individuals differently. Um, but you seem to focus only on the within uh, mm -hmm. individual yes. um, part of predicting uh, vocational interest. And as you said, I think maybe one of the reasons <laughs> why these, these uh, lowest track students are more certain is because they, they just follow the pattern their parents uh, show them, model them. So, but my question really is about um, if you could do it again and, and uh, you wouldn't have to uh, stick to the variables that are included in the uh, onderwijs monitor, which variables do you think are essential to include to be able to really see, okay, this is, this is personality and this is context? Mm -hmm. what, what would you focus on if you could start over and have uh, a lot of money so you could recruit <laughs> uh, thousands of participants? Yeah. What would you include? Yeah, thank you very much for that second question. Um, so you are asking like, if we could do this research again, if we had infinite, infinite time and money, mm -hmm. um, what would we include and look at and take into consideration as well. So um, one thing you just touched upon yourself um, is the, the background of the students, of course, so the socioeconomic background. <laughs> and there is variables asking about this. So uh, what kind of educational level do the parents have, for mm -hmm. example? Um, what kind of job do they have? What is the net income of the family? Um, that is very important. Uh, I would say. Then also, what is the family structure, right? How many siblings are in the family? Is that individual the first, second, or maybe fifth child of the family? Um, does the mother stay at home? There's so many um, things you would have to include mm -hmm. um, from the outside perspective regarding the family, for example. Um, you would probably also need to include what is the pressure on the students. Yeah. So what I would be really interested about would be um, what do your parents, but not only the parents, maybe there's also other guardians or um, people around who put pressure on the students to have a certain academic level. Um, I would be really interested in that. I would really love to, to explore that as well. It's, it's not included in the data yet, but um, that would be great. Um, yeah, maybe also religious pressures that mm -hmm. could um, in, um, influence the students. Um, yes, and then you were also talking, because you were calling it within the student, uh, and you yeah. were referring to the environment, right? Yeah. Um, maybe I can add something which doesn't really concern the environment, but the outside, because what I would also love to do, which is also very necessary, which science shows is that we also need other ratings, right? So we, in this whole dissertation, we talk about 
self-ratings of personality, self-ratings of um, service in general. So, um, of course, in the in the data uh, in the on the base monitor, there is also questions to the to the parents. But to explore this data again, we would also need. Um, other ratings on personality of the students. So yeah. we could combine that all. And that is not so included in the parental measures? I, the, don't, the I don't think so. Be because I was also I thinking that the fact that there are so many other influences on these children could explain why during the COVID pandemic and yes. everything changed, the, 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 um, the influence of personality suddenly disappeared almost completely. Yes. Yeah, 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 could be. I mean, yeah, we unfortunately, we couldn't look no. at everything, uh, you know that, but um, yes, of course, that could have been the case. I mean, there, there are so many other factors that could have been a reason for um, personality dis disappearing. Yeah, right. thank you. Yes, well, uh, thank you, I'm, I think I'm good. <laughs> thank you. Johanna Schmitz, Pfeiffer. The time appointed for defending your thesis has passed, and the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defence. And I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Get the
Super. Johanna Schmitz Pfeiffer, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense, and in view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. The Professor Shields is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom, and I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Please use the microphone. <laughs> Independent and responsible. <laughs> yes, I promise. Thank you. By the authority vested in us by law and in conform conformity with the decision of the committee, here I present, I hereby confer upon you, Johanna Schmitz Pfeiffer, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. 
As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Ja, liebe Johanna, jetzt geht es erstmal auf Deutsch weiter, damit auch die Familie und die Oma ein bisschen was mitbekommen. Ähm, ja, wir wollen dir erstmal von Herzen zu deiner bestandenen Promotion gratulieren. Das ist wirklich ähm, ja, ein ganz besonderer Tag und wir freuen uns riesig mit dir und freuen uns, dass wir den heute zusammen feiern können. Jetzt muss ich doch nochmal auf den Zettel specken. Ja, also in äh, Vorbereitung auf diese Laudatio haben Trudi und ich ähm, miteinander gesprochen natürlich und haben überlegt, wie hat denn eigentlich alles angefangen? <lacht> und du erinnerst dich vielleicht ähm, auch noch, also es war genau vor fünf Jahren, dass ich äh, eine E-Mail von einem Kollegen bekam, Philipp Verdöhn, der dir wahrscheinlich noch was sagt, das ist ähm, einer der ähm, Koordinatoren von dem Master, den du gemacht hast, Human Decision Science. Und äh, der hat mir eine E-Mail geschrieben, dass er eine nette Studentin äh, hätte, die interessiert wäre an einer Promotion. Und äh, die Studentin äh, würde deshalb gerne ähm, ja, schon eine Master-Arbeitsbetreuerin finden, die dann auch bereit wäre, diese Promotion zu begleiten. Und ähm, ganz grob sagt er, es geht um Karriereentscheidung oder Karriereberatung und ähm, ob ich Interesse daran hat, hätte. Und er schrieb in seiner E-Mail, ähm, ich habe einen sehr positiven Eindruck von ihr. Sie ist eine typische, gut vorbereitete, motivierte deutsche Studentin. <lacht> und auch wenn Klischees natürlich nicht immer zutreffen, ähm, muss ich doch sagen, dass diese Adjektive gut vorbereitet und hochmotiviert äh, sehr gut auf dich passten. Und äh, natürlich sind das nicht die einzigen Dinge, die äh, ich über dich sagen kann und möchte. Ähm, ja, im Laufe der Zeit, also im Rahmen der Masterarbeit, aber auch im Rahmen der Promotion jetzt, ähm, hatten wir natürlich das Glück, dich noch besser kennenzulernen und ähm, ja, haben gemerkt, wie sehr du für das Thema Persönlichkeit im Kontext der Karriereberatung brennst, aber auch, ähm, ja, dass du einfach unwahrscheinlich proaktiv, enthusiastisch bist, kommunikationsstark, ganz engagiert und aber auch ganz ja, offen, freundlich und unwahrscheinlich herzlich. Und ähm, jetzt übergebe ich erstmal an Trudi. Danke. I'll continue in English, sorry. <lacht> Entschuldigung. Uh, PhD trajectories are always adventurous, which in your case actually seems to be in your genes. For those who don't know, Joanna's family owns a fun park, Spieleland, in Germany, where the combination of work and fun are at the core. I see many similarities between the fun park and your PhD. Both are on the one hand about exploring, discovering, having fun, excitement, streaming, sometimes falling off the swings and getting up again. And on the other hand about management, decision making, bringing the right people together, and keeping an eye on both the details and on the overall picture. It is all reflected in your PhD. You will definitely agree with us, I guess. Your adventure was also characterized by great curiosity and the willingness to do research in support of decision-making by adolescents with respect to their future. You are a strong believer that it's not possible by looking at this from one perspective that showed. Already in your master, you combined the two dif disciplines of economics and psychology and you continue to do that in your PhD thesis. Your work is a true merge between the two disciplines, which is not an easy endeavor. It is new territory that you are exploring. The language and scientific cultures still differ between the two disciplines, which also shows in the different chapters. Your thesis is a real milestone in multidisciplinary research. You reach this by asking a lot of questions, 
and even more of them, great perseverance, and bringing the right people together. You created a team of people that were of support, again from both disciplines. Both Marion Spengler, a well-known personality psychologist, and Bart Goldstein, a well-known personality economist, were part of the research team. <laughs> we, were all talking, we were all taking the adventurous rides in this fun park together. Another aspect of your PhD journey is that you were not a regular internal PhD. These are taken into the flow and part of a cohort. You were a so-called external PhD, which means that you write a PhD next to having another job. That is not easy, as you have to juggle and keep many balls in the air. We are so proud that you managed to do this and continue the PhD despite some setbacks, both in your research and your private life. However, as is the case with adventure rights, despite the setbacks, you can look back at a valuable, exciting and fun trip that yields important insights for future projects. And, can, and you can be very proud about yourself. You not only leave us with important research in support of adolescents' decisions, you also learned a lot more about yourself. Ja, jetzt möchte ich äh, zum Abschluss noch eine kleine Anekdote zum Besten geben. Ich glaube, du weißt, was jetzt kommt, Johanna. Ähm, und zwar ähm, erzähle ich diese Anekdote, weil sie par excellence ähm, eigentlich zeigt, wie sehr Johanna motiviert war und was für eine große Willenskraft sie hatte, diese Promotion zu einem Ende zu bringen, äh, zu einem guten Ende <lacht> zu bringen. Und ähm, zwar war es so, dass Johanna in einer recht schwierigen Phase steckte und zu uns nach Maastricht kam um zu besprechen, wie es mit der Arbeit weitergehen sollte. Und ähm, ja, in diesem Treffen hat sie mir und Trudi ziemlich deutlich gemacht, dass sie sehr gewillt ist, diese Promotion oder die Arbeit jetzt in den nächsten Wochen und Monaten zu Ende zu bringen. Was wir natürlich auch gut fanden, haben wir uns äh, gefreut und das unterstützt. Und dann sagte sie ähm, mehr oder weniger beiläufig am Ende, ja, ähm, ich habe übrigens das Auto ähm, voll Sachen gepackt und ich habe meinen Eltern gesagt, vielleicht komme ich heute nicht wieder. Und ähm, ja, ich, ich bleibe eventuell die nächsten Wochen einfach hier in Maastricht. Und ähm, ja, das hat uns dann doch so ein bisschen auf, aus der Bahn geworfen, vor allen Dingen, ähm, weil Johanna meinte, ja, ich, ich weiß auch noch nicht, wo ich schlafe <lacht> und ähm, wo ich die nächsten Wochen bleibe. Das war dann natürlich am Ende kein Problem, du hast das gut gelöst und ähm, ja, ich bin sehr froh, dass du sehr beherzt und sehr spontan ähm, in diesen Tagen dein Auto vollgepackt hast und bei uns geblieben bist. Ähm, ich bin nicht sicher, wie alles zu Ende geg gegangen wäre, ähm, hättest du das nicht getan. Du hast in den Wochen sehr große Fortschritte gemacht und ja, alles zu einem guten Ende gebracht. Und ja, wir glauben, du kannst sehr, sehr stolz auf dich sein. Wir sind es auf jeden Fall und möchten, wir, möchten dir nochmal von Herzen gratulieren und ja, alles Liebe und Gute für deine weiteren Schritte. Dear Dr. Schmitz Pfeiffer, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you, your family, your friends, your supervisors uh, with the degree you have acquired. Um, I would like to give the both uh, opponents online an opportunity to also congratulate you before I close this session and tell something about the procedure. Uh, so please, the floor goes to Professor Roberts and then to Dr. Dix. Dr. Smith Pfeiffer, um, I believe the proper term is Glückwunsch, um, at least at my poor enunciation of that. Or pronunciation of that. Um, it was a, uh, an honor um, and a pleasure to be part of this process. Uh, the, the dissertation itself was very impressive from my perspective, and I can pay no better uh, compliment than to say I really look forward to seeing um, you progress in your career and the research that emerges out of this effort. Thank you. Dr. Dix. Yeah, dear Dr. Schmitz Pfeiffer, a uh, herzlichen Glückwunsch. Um, congratulations on this great achievement. And I wish you all the best for your further career. And now that I've learned that you were actually uh, an external PhD, uh, the question of vocational decisiveness is apparently already solved for you. So I wish you all the best <laughs> for your further career. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. With, with the two of you, I would also like to thank all the other three members of the degree committee uh, for their contribution. What we will do is we'll take a picture here uh, with the both opponents in the background. Um, then we'll take a picture as 
uh, is a custom on the stairs. And, and the auditorium, please, if you feel like it, go to the rafter and uh, take a glass and something to drink. Uh, we will make sure that she will come to the rafter uh, too with, with her doctor's degree, uh, just to make sure that you can celebrate it uh, all together. Uh, with this, I close this session. Recording stopped.